have not yet subscribed to my email newsletter, go to rabbitwalby.com forward slash newsletter. The feedback we've gotten so far is absolutely terrific. I pledge to keep it interesting, to keep it stimulating. I promise not to bore you. And if this is something you're interested in, uh, please dot every every please dot every Thursday. I'm going to send out a new email newsletter. You want to give it a chance? Go to rabbitwalby.com forward slash newsletter, and you can subscribe. We spoke last time about the Gemara and the Talmud, two names for the same thing, and we spoke about its role in explaining and elaborating on the laws of the Mishnah. We have the Mishnah. And it's a finalized, canonized work that includes all of the laws of oral Torah, but written very succinctly, very uh, with, 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 with pithy precision, and really not elaborated. And comes on the Talmud 300 years later, and the Talmud is the codified explanation and, and elaboration of the Mishnah. But there is another portion of the Talmud that is not about explaining the laws of the Mishnah. In fact, it's not about explaining laws at all. And it is called the Agada or the Agadeta, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So we have Talmud, and it could generally be broken down into two different categories. One of them is what we call law or halacha, in the words of the Talmud in Aramaic, it's called Shmaitza. And this would include everything in the Talmud that's coming to explain and elaborate upon the Mishnah. And then there's the second portion called the Agadita or the Agada or the Hagada in Hebrew. And that is broadly defined as the non legal portions of the Talmud. Typically, the Talmud is about elaborating on the Mishnah. The Mishnah is talking about a certain law or a certain mitzvah. The Mishnah is talking about a certain law or a certain mitzvah. And the objective of the Talmud is to parse out every detail of the law of the Mishnah. And then there are sections of the Talmud that don't deal with any law, with any Mishnah, and they are something else. They're called Agadita. Well, if it's not dealing with laws of the Mishnah, what is it dealing with? And the answer is a lot of different things. It could be ethics. It could be Jewish faith. It could be theology. It could be all manners of philosophy, history, stories and lessons from our sages, axioms and aphorisms of the sages. You could see in the Agatha some truly bizarre sounding statements. You could read descriptions of supernatural things. There's all kinds of medical advice as well. There are some bland sounding humdrum statements that seem to be totally devoid of any meaning. And of course, there is a lot in the Talmud that's trying to explain verses of scripture, similar to the way Midrash does it. You have a verse in scripture, it's telling a story, it's telling a narrative, it's not necessarily talking about a law, it's not necessarily talking about a mitzvah, and it's a story. And how do we understand the story? The Talmud is often going to elaborate on it in a way similar to Midrash. So anything that would not follow the question of what the law is, what is the mitzvah, how is the mitzvah fulfilled, what are the parameters of a certain behavior, a certain law, anything that's not that, would generally be classified as Agadata. Now, to understand Agadata, we have to start, I think, with a more general question of what it is, what the goal of the Agadata is, and then try to drill down to more specifics. Because what we discover is that Shmaitza, or the halachic portions of the Talmud, is difficult to study especially if we're not trained in the rigors of Talmudic back and forth. But that difficulty is exponentially increased once we get to the Agatha. So if you thought Talmud was hard, oh my gosh, there's a Mishnah, there's all kinds of laws of back and forth and argumentation. 
If that was hard, you meet the Agatha, and it's an entirely different method, an entirely different approach of how to understand what the message is, and it's infinitely more difficult. Okay, so what's the general goal of the Agatha? We know with the halachic portions of the Talmud, it's understand the halacha. We, we want to fulfill the will of the Almighty. We want to wear our tefillin properly and have the mezuzah fixed on our door properly and obey the laws of Shabbos properly. And we have the general kind of headlines of the laws in the Mishnah. It comes on the Talmud and explains all the details. Makes sense. We know what it is. But the Agadita is something else. It's not telling us how to do any mitzvah. It's not telling us how to fulfill a law. What is its purpose? So our sages tell us that there's three general purposes in the Agadita. Number one is what's called Musar, which means ethics, which means how to behave, how to develop yourself, how to refine yourself, how to improve yourself. The Torah is not about creating robots that are just doing the will of God, just putting on their fill, and it's about creating people who become great. And they're, of course, you know, part of that is fulfilling the laws. But part of that is, is developing with the human side of, of what it means to be a human. And that is part of the goal of the Agatha, to give us the tools that we need to refine ourselves, to improve ourselves, to transform ourselves. That's part number one of the Agatha. Part number two is what we call Kabbalah, meaning the mysticism of Torah, the hidden parts of Torah, the secret the wisdom of Torah, the inner workings of creation, the inner workings of our soul, the deep, hidden, mysterious parts of the Torah, the layers beneath the veneer of Torah. When is that conveyed to us? That's the second part of the Agatha. And finally, the third part of the Agatha is explanation of verses in Scripture. We have stories in Scripture. Of course, the book of Genesis is mostly stories. And how do we understand the stories? What's actually happening when Jacob and Esau are, are wrestling in utero? What's happening when Jacob buys the firstborn right for a bowl of lentils? What's actually happening when Jacob is having to negotiate with his wily uncle and father-in-law. What's the backstory behind it all? That, of course, is going to be elaborated upon in, in the Talmud in a way similar to the way it's done in the Midrash. So what is Agatha? It is the Torah that relates to character development and to the hidden mysticism of the Torah and to the explanation of the verses in scripture, not just of the Torah, not just of the Pentateuch, but of all of Tanakh, all of the 24 books of our canonized Bible. <coughs> now, the Ramchal has, <coughs> now the Ramchal has an excellent primer on, on, on the Agatha, and he explains at the beginning of his primer why it was written. Like why do we have this whole other portion of the Talmud? And he explains that just as there was a fear, there was a concern that the oral Torah in general would be forgotten. Things are too chaotic. The nation is getting dispersed. There are edicts prohibiting Torah sight. The continuity of the Torah is in peril. And therefore, there was a need to write the Mishnah, write the Talmud. So, too, there was the same concern. What's going to be with the hidden parts of the Torah, with the theological principles of the Torah, with the godly principles of the Torah, with the secret hidden wisdom of the Torah? That, too, is part of the Torah tradition. That, too, is part of the oral Torah. And that, too, was transmitted teacher to student. 
But what's going to be when we no longer have the ability to transmit Torah to the next generation because of the circumstances? We have to write it down as well. There has to be the same sort of process to canonize and formulize the oral Torah in a written form for the next generation for posterity. But this is the critical point. The solution has to be different. Meaning, the solution for the revealed parts of the Torah has to be different than the solution for the concealed parts of the Torah. With the revealed parts of the Torah, all the laws, all the mitzvahs, all the halachic portions of the Torah, you want to spell it out as clearly as possible. So you have the Mishnah, and then the Talmud, and it's really trying to find the truth, the bottom line of all these laws. But what about the mystical parts of the Torah? What about the Kabbalah? What about the deepest secrets that we have? How are we going to convey that? To write that down, to write down the deepest secrets that we have. We don't want to make it available for everyone. It's very dangerous to make it av available for everyone. What happens if you publicize the laws? Not, not, nothing bad can happen. There's no danger of publicizing the laws. But there is a tremendous danger by making the secrets of the Torah available for all. First of all, he says, this is the wisdom of God. And it is a tremendous disgrace if godly wisdom is going to be in the hands of people who are unrefined. Moreover, these ideas are very, very deep and profound. And if it gets in the hands of the people who are not ready for it, it's going to be perverted. And therefore, the sages were faced with this terrible problem. On one hand, they had to write down the secrets of the Torah. Had to write it down. On the other hand, they couldn't write it down. Because what happens? You write it down, and now it's available for everyone. There's no way to constrict, to withhold that information from people that shouldn't be having it. So this is an intractable problem. You must write it down, and you may not do it. So they came up with a solution. They found a way to thread the needle. What they did is as follows. They wrote it down, but they wrote it down in a way that it will remain locked to all but the worthiest. And the way the Ramchal explains, they put it in a door, put it in a safe, they locked it, and they handed the keys from generation to generation. Meaning, if you don't have the keys to understand it, even though you can read the words, but it's encoded, it's encrypted, and unless you have the decryption codes, unless you were given the keys of how to decipher this message, <coughs> this agarata, you will not understand anything. And that's the way, the creative way, the ingenious way that they found to solve their problem. You have to write it. They wrote it. You have to mask it and obscure from the people that should not be studying it. And they managed to do that as well. So what do we have? We have a tale of two Talmuds. There's two general sections. You have the halachic portions of the Talmud, the Shmaitza, and then you have the Agadic portions of the Talmud. And even though they're found in the same book, they could not be more different. Because the goals of the architects of the Talmud in writing them was the, exactly the opposite. With respect to the halachic portions, the goals were to reveal the meaning was to publicize the myth, the meaning. Whereas with respect to the Agarata, the goal was to obscure the meaning. The goal was to conceal 
the true meaning. And therefore, it's much harder to study the Agadita because you can read the words on a surface level, but you know for sure that when this was written, this was written in a way specifically to mask, to obscure, to obfuscate, to conceal the true meaning. And it's just incredible. You have the same book, and you go from, let's say, one page over here, halachic portion of the Talmud, and it's like rigorously asking every question to try to get the try to get to the truth. And then you have you turn the page and you, you go to an an agatic portion, and it's ideas that are not defined. It's ideas that really seem to be contradictory. You really have no idea what's going on, and there's no elaboration, there's no questioning, there's no there's no investigation, there's nothing. You, you're not helped at all. And, and now you know you see what the sages have done. They've dropped a diamond here in front of you, but they've hidden it in a way that it's really, really hard to discover what the message is. So I want to give you a little bit of a taste of some of the flavor of the agata, or the agatic portion, the agatata. I collected, you know, I don't know, 10 or 12 different teachings from different books of the Talmud. Every book of the Talmud has Agatha portions in it. Some have more than others. Like, for example, the book of Brachos, the first book in the Talmud, has a relatively high proportion, a portion of uh, Agatha teachings. Uh, the book of Sanhedrin is famous because it has an entire chapter of 23 pages that's nothing but Agatha. But most of all, I would say it's probably, you know, 98 to 2. 98% of the Talmud is probably, um, just on average, is the Alachic portion, and then 2% of the Agatic portion. So I'm going to kind of run through some of these teachings just to see, you know, the flavor of, of what an Agatic portion of Talmud looks like. And again, like we said last time, with respect to the Halachic portions, it's a teaching, it's a question, it's a proof, it's a back and forth, it's, uh, it's an assumption, it's you know, bringing in other citations. There's a lot a lot going into investigating what is happening over here. And with respect to the Agatha, there's none of that. Absolutely none of that. There's no dialogue. It's not dialectical at all. All you have is a statement, and it doesn't really make any sense, and there's obvious questions, and you don't know what's going on. And that's the Agatha. So let's run through some of them here. I'll just select you know, the first uh, five or six books of the Talmud. I picked one from every, from every book. So in Brachos, uh, uh, Brachos, in Brachos 57b, we read as follows. There are five things that are one sixtieths, and they are fire, honey, Shabbos, sleep, and a dream. These are all one sixtieth. Fire is a sixtieth of Gehenna. Honey is a sixtieth of the manna. Shabbos is a sixtieth of Olam Abba. Sleep is a 60th of death. Dream is a 60th of prophecy. And that's it. That's all you have. What does that mean? What's the message? What's the secret? What's the insight? You don't get any of that. In the Talmud, it goes right away to something else. So again, a very different format. Okay, let's move on to the next book in the Talmud, the book of Shabbos, page 31a. And these are famous teachings in the Agatha. So you may have heard them before. Amar Rava. Rava says, Rava is the name that's the most popular name in all of Talmud, the name that appears most frequently. At a time when a person is entered in front of God for divine judgment, they ask him the following questions. Did you do business with integrity? Did you set aside time for Torah study? Did you engage in procreation? Did you anticipate Redemption. Did you dwell in wisdom? Did you understand one thing from another thing? So different kinds of wisdom. Be able to delve into it and to understand one thing from another. And even so, even if he has six checks, every one of them he answered in the affirmative. If he has fear of God, then it's great. And if not, then not. So again, this is an idea. This is a philosophical idea. This is an eschatological idea. This is a theological idea. And again, 
it's what's called agadic. It's not that there's a certain mitzvah that the Talmud is trying to figure out how to fulfill. It's an idea that's more philosophical, and that would fall under the category of the Agadata. Okay, let's move on to the next book of Talmud, the book of Ervin, on Ervin 19a, which is a page that has a lot of Agadah teachings on it. We read the following. The sinners of the Jewish people, <coughs> the sinners of the Jewish people that are filled with mitzvos, like a pomegranate. What's a verse? Verse in Song of Songs seems to support this idea. The empty ones of the Jewish people are filled with mitzvos like a pomegranate. Again, this is not a law. This is not a mitzvah. This is an idea that demands our understanding, and it's not immediately clear what the message is, that the sinners amongst us, the empty ones amongst us, are filled with mitzvos like a pomegranate. Let's go to the next book of Talmud, Psachim 118a. Amr Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan says, feeding a person, sustaining a person, that is more difficult than redemption. Oh, you think redemption is hard? Try to feed someone. Again, what that means, that's all you have. Short, very succinct teaching. It's not clear what the message is. And uh, it's just... It, that's the Agadata, trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, the book of Yoma, page 20b. There's three sounds that reverberate across the whole world. And they are the sound of the orbit of the sun, and the sound of the crowds of Rome, and the sound of a soul as it departs the body. And there are some who add a fourth sound, and that is the sound of childbirth. What does this mean? What are these three sounds that reverberate throughout the whole world? What is the message? It's not at all immediately clear. And finally, the last example that we'll bring right now, we'll have some more examples later on. The book of Sukkah, page 52a. This is one of the most dramatic teachings in the Agarata. And again, the, the Talmud just has it all interspersed together. You'll have a halachic portion, and they'll just meander, segue to an agadic portion without really telling you, oh, you should know, put on your agadic cap right now. Just, that's where the Talmud works. So 52a, <coughs> <coughs> so Sukkah 52a, Rabbi Huda taught, in the future, the Almighty will bring the Eitzahara and slaughter it in front of the tzaddikim, in front of the righteous people, and in front of the wicked people. And according to the tzaddikim, they will see, and it will look like a great mountain. And the wicked people, it would appear to them like a thin strand of hair. And these two groups, these two cohorts, are both going to be crying. The tzaddikim, the righteous, are crying, and they're going to say, how did we overcome this great mountain? And the wicked will cry, and they will say, how did we not overcome this thin, flimsy strand of hair? Again, there's no mitzvah here that the Talmud's trying to parse out and understand. It's an idea. It's a philosophical idea. In the future, the mind's going to slaughter the Yitzhak. What does that mean? It's not at all immediately clear. And that's the Agarata. You have teachings that it was necessary to convey. It was necessary to perpetuate. But by design, the only way to do it is to conceal the meaning. And how it's actually the meaning is concealed, I say just tell us that the most basic degree of concealment is analogy. That the real message is hidden beneath the facade of a parable, of an allegory, of a story, of an axiom. There's something on the surface that you see, but that is concealing, that is enshrouding the true meaning that you don't see. And only someone who has the skills, like I said, the keys, the decryption codes, to be able to break through the facade and see what the actual hidden meaning is, that's, all, that's the only person, <coughs> that's the only person that is able to discover the true message. The Ramchal also says that sometimes very deep ideas 
are hidden behind seemingly bland, empty, innocuous statements. He gives an example from the Talmud, the book of Shabbos, page 152a. It's telling us that the emperor had a question for one of the great rabbis. And he said to him, why don't you come to have a debate with everyone else? How come you're not participating in the debate? They used to have the big debate forums, a place called Bay Avidon. They would have dialogue and debate and polemics. And the greatest Jewish debater was Rabbi Yehoshua. And he didn't come. So the emperor says, Heck, how come you didn't participate? So he responded to him like this. So he responded like this. The snowy mountain is surrounded with ice. The dogs don't bark. The grinders have ceased grinding. And I am searching for that which I have not lost. Which means, so Rashi already explains, what does this mean? It means that he's old. So the mountain is covered with ice, snowy mountain. His hair is all white. And his dogs don't bark means his voice no longer strong enough. And the grinders have ceased grinding. His teeth have fallen out. And he is searching for that he, that, he does not, he, that he hasn't lost, meaning he's all bent over. Like an old person's bent over, maybe holding a cane, and it looks like he's searching for something, but really he's not searching. He's just old. That's what it means. He, he's giving them these analogies as to why he's not able to come to participate. Says the Ramchal, what you're reading over here, that is the mask. But what the actual message is, is straight up Kabbalah. But you don't know what it is because it's hidden. And that's just the way that these things work. And then he adds, if you look at the successive Gemara, right, right afterwards, again, Shabbos 152a, it says the following statement. Two feet of a young person are better than three feet of an old person. Well, how does an old person have three feet? The answer is he has a cane. That's the third foot. So it's better to have three. So it's better to have two feet than it, than it is to have three feet. Okay, what does that mean? Again, it's something which which sounds like a bumper sticker, but it doesn't, it's not clear what the what the message is. And this is an example of the mask concealing the message. Moreover, crucial details and qualifications are often omitted. So the way the teaching is conveyed is lacking necessary information to understand it. And those pieces, either you have to know coming in, maybe that's the key, or you have to know from a different source. And therefore, if you just see the statement, you don't have all the information that you need to understand it. Moreover, the necessary pieces of a given idea or, or a given subject are scattered throughout the Talmud. If you have a halachic portion of the Talmud, you'll know, okay, you know, the, the, the source for all the material on this subject is found in this book, this book of Talmud. Maybe there's two places where it has it, but it's defined. You know where to find all the information that you need to be able to assemble the information to understand it. With respect to a subject, a surya, as they say, in the Agatha, you don't know where to find the, the missing pieces. It's you're trying to find a puzzle and you don't know which teachings are relevant and which are not. And that's a way, again, you can write it all down, but unless you have the insight, the wisdom, the guidance to know which pieces connect to create all the information that you need to understand, you're missing the keys. And therefore, the message can be concealed from you. And finally, the Ramchal writes that often they would use in the Talmud scientific information and technological information that was accepted in their times. So if you look at the Talmud, sometimes it says things that are just not true. We know today, scientifically, they've been disproven. Says the Ramchal, they're not talking about science. They're talking about Kabbalah, or they're talking about Musr. It's the Agarata. And oftentimes they would use accepted convention, accepted understanding of the consensus of the science of the time, just as a means to convey a different idea. And therefore, don't look at the 
Talmud as a book of science, look at it as the book of wisdom, and sometimes it would employ a scientific masquerade, so to speak, to be able to conceal, to enshroud its teachings. And with this in mind, we clearly must not understand the bizarre teachings of the Agada, the Agadata, as literal. So there's a few famous pages of Agadata in the book of Bava Basra, page 73, 74, 75. <clears throat> and these are so strange and they're so clearly not literal. This is a great example of how the Agata <clears throat> of how the Agata operates. So for example, this is an actual teaching from Bava Basra, page 73b. Rabba said, one of the great sages, I have seen a day-old antelope that was as large as Mount Tabor. And how large is Mount Tabor? It's four parsings. Now, what's a parsing? Parsing is roughly three miles. So a mountain with four parsings is roughly 12 miles big. So we have a sage describing an animal, a day-old animal, that's the size of, you know, 12 miles long. What this means, I don't know, but it's, it's not literal. That I know for sure. Continues the Talmud. And Rava, Rava Barbarhana says, I have seen a certain frog that was as large as the fort of Hagronia, the size of a fort. And how large is this fort? It is as large as 60 houses. And a snake came and swallowed the frog. And a raven came and swallowed the snake. And it flew up and sat in a tree. <coughs> and see how great is the strength of the tree, that it could bear the weight of that raven. And Rav Papa Bar Shmuel said, if I had not been there and seen it myself, I would never have believed it. So what's going on here? I don't know. But this is the Agarata play. There's something hidden, and what we are told is something which is supernatural, which is clearly an allegory. It is clearly something which is concealing the true meaning. And by the way, if you want to read some more fantastic Agatic accounts, there's a whole bunch of them in those pages, Mavastra 73 through 75. So the Rambam, in his introduction to chapter 10 of the book of Sanhedrin, which is, like we said earlier, the chapter that is entirely dedicated to the Agatha. He tells us that there's three different kinds of students of the Agatha. There are, number one, the simple-minded people who take everything literally. They're incapable, says the Ramam, of imagining that the sages think differently than them. And they think only in one dimension, and therefore, they imagine that everyone else must think only on, on one dimension. And the, Rambam, and the Rambam just absolutely lambasts these people. He says, they're paupers of knowledge, and they're fools, and we should feel bad for them. And they destroy Torah, and instead of Torah being lauded by others, when they're the ones who espouse Torah, Torah is going to be derided by others. And instead, they should keep their mouth shut, and they should admit their ignorance because they don't have the tools to understand the Agatha. That's group number one. Group number two is even worse. They too take everything literally, but they do it with the intention of maligning the words of the sages. They have nefarious intentions. They want to defame and slander the words of the sages. And they claim intellectual superiority to the sages, which is laughable, which is risible. And the Ramam says this group, the group of the heretics, they are a cursed group. And finally, there's a third group. Not simple-minded literalists, not nefarious literalists, literalists, but there's a small group, the third group. And it's so small that we really can't even call it a group, says the Ram. It's like saying that the sun is a group of stars. There's only one sun. How can we call it a group of stars? That's the same thing to call this group, the third group, 
to call it a group. So few people actually fall into this category. <coughs> and these are the people that understand the greatness of the sages and the sharpness of their intellect. And they understand that when the sages describe something which is impossible, they understand that it's a metaphor. And they understand that the words of the sages have a hidden and a revealed meaning. And they understand the idea of allegory, the idea of riddle. And they understand that the wisest of all men, namely King Solomon, he employed this tactic in the book of Proverbs, in the book of Song of Songs, in much of the book of Ecclesiastes. And that is the way that the great sages, the great titanic intellects, that's how, that's how they convey these very subtle teachings. And concludes the rabbi, and the rabbi, and the rabbi concludes with a stark warning. He says, if you're part of group one or group two, don't study what I have to say. It's going to harm you. It's not good for you. But if you are part of this third cohort, to be able to understand the subtlety, the nuance, the sensitivity of how the sages convey the advanced teaching of the Agarita, then come and study with me. We'll study it together and it will be helpful for you. So we have a whole other body of oral Torah. It's the hidden wisdom of Torah. It's the secrets of Torah. And it was, it was necessary to preserve it, to perpetuate it, but it was done in a way that not everyone will understand it. We have the Agarata, but it's encrypted. It's encoded. There's the mass. There's the facade. There are descriptions that are very obscure. Things are hidden. There is illusions. And again, it's scattered throughout the Talmud. So unless someone is really well-versed, someone's a real sage, and someone who has the training to understand it, you have no idea what it is, and you'll just misunderstand it. And like the Ram says, it's probably better for you to ignore it. But I think, you know, as someone who spent time in yeshiva, students in the yeshiva tend to, I would say, foolishly ignore the Agarata. Like we said, the Agarata is only a small portion of the Talmud. But every few pages, you have a line or two. Sometimes you'll have a whole page of, of Agarata. And it's a big mistake to skip it. First of all, it's a part of Torah. Why would you skip it? The Maharal, when he has his introduction to Agarata, he says that we have to believe the Torah is divine. And if someone doesn't believe that the Agarata is part of that corpus, is part of the divine Torah, then they're included amongst the people that are repudiating the Torah, and according to Jewish law, they have no portion in Olam because a prerequisite to have a portion of Olam is to believe in the divinity of Torah, and the whole Torah, not just parts of Torah, not just the revealed Torah, not just the halachic parts of the Torah, but also the Agarata. Moreover, there's a very interesting Midrash. The Midrash says like this, if you want to know, to get to know God. You want to know he who said and the world became. You should study the Agadita. The Agadita is the part of Torah that connects man to God. Through study of the Agadita, you will understand God and you will cleave to him. So obviously this is a very important portion of oral Torah and of Torah in general. And the Gona Vilna, he adds that both disciplines of the Talmud, the halachic and the non-halachic, the Agadic portions of the Talmud, are both needed to achieve mastery over the Yetzirah. And what he says is very interesting. He says there's two types of Yetzirah, two types of evil inclination. There's one that generally is there to get us to be angry, and there's one that's generally there to get us to be lustful. Those are the two general parts of the Yetzirah. 
And these are combated, these are countered with the two types of Talmud. The halachic portions of the Talmud, the Shmaitza, and the Agadic portions of the Talmud, the Agadita. The Shmaitza, that's there to quell the fire of anger. And the Agadita, that is there to counter the Yetzirahara, the evil inclination for lust. And both of them together well, it will enable us to overcome and to be elevated <clears throat> and to be elevated above the petty impulses of the Yetzirahara. My grandfather, blessed memory, pointed out as well that in our spiritual development, there's really there's really two parts. There is, and it's based upon a verse, the Adata Hayo Bahashivosa El You should know like the day, and you should return to your to your heart. We have our, our spiritual life in our intellect, and we have our spiritual life in our heart, in our emotions. And these two are going to be addressed by different parts of Torah. The Shmaitza, the halakhic portion of the Torah, that is to get into our head. And to get to our heart, that is done via the Agadaza. My grandfather, the blessed memory, used to say, you see people who don't focus on the Agadaza, and there's something missing. The learning, the study is not alive. Their heart's not there. It's a little bit, I would say, or what he would say, is it's a little bit dry. They're, they're not as alive spiritually because they are neglecting a portion of the Torah that's there to bring their heart into it. Okay, so I'm convinced. Let us study the Agadita. How do we do it? We mentioned earlier, it's much harder to do it. How indeed do we study the Agadita? So the first thing I would suggest is try to find some guidance. Try to find some commentary that's going to help us. You know, there's much fewer commentaries on the Agata on the Agata portions than there are on the Shmaitza portions. And generally speaking, you have the Maharsha, the Maharal. On some portions of the Talmud, you have the the Gra, the Gona Vilna. You have the Ben Yehoyada, and a few others. So the first thing I would suggest is find a citation. Find a citation in the Agarata and study it together with one of the commentaries. Like I said, there's lots of it in the book of Brachos. You have the entire chapter at the end of Sanhedrin. Let me walk y'all through just a, a quick Agarata teaching in the book of Kiddushin on page 31a. This is a very famous teaching in the Agarata. The Talmud says, well, how much must a person honor their parents? So to honor our parents, it's, the, it's part of the Ten Commandments. How much do we have to do it? Says the Talmud, go see what an idolater did for his father. And he was a man who lived in the city of Ashkelon. His name was Dama ben Nesina. And he was a gem dealer. And he had a gem that the sages really needed because one of the stones in the breastplate of the high priest fell out and they had to replace it quickly and they would pay any price. And they went to visit this gem dealer. And the problem was that the key to open the safe was under his daddy's pillow. So he told them, sorry, I can't help you. I don't have the key. So he said, okay, and they went to the next gem dealer. And they went to the next gem dealer. And consequently, he lost out on all the money. All the deal. He would have made a huge profit because the sages would have charged him, because the sages would have paid for it, whatever he asked for. And the next year, in merit of his forfeiture of all that profit to honor his father, amongst his livestock, a perfectly unblemished red heifer was born. And he sold that to the sages 
for the exact amount of profit that he would have made, because he recognized this is a gift from God. That's what the Talmud says. And this is a very famous story, and it's, I would say, it probably qualifies to be part of the Ayyadah teachings of, of, of the Talmud. And it's an obviously perplexing story. You know, our sages are asking for guidance of how far someone has to go to be someone who honors their parents properly. And the only person they could find is some Gentile, is some idolater in Ashkelon. Why do we need to tell where he's from? Why a Gentile? Why does he get a red heifer? It's really not clear what the message is. And I would advise you, look at the Maharal and how he explains this story, and every detail of the story to reveal some of the hidden wisdom behind the interesting tale. Just as an aside, the Maharal, <coughs> such an incredible commentator on everything, but certainly on the Agatha, where every nuance of the teaching, every word is dissected and is explained, and every 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 piece is just an absolute masterpiece. Now, if you want to brave it and go it alone, you don't want to follow one of the commentaries. You want to actually study yourself. I'm going to give you the instructions to do that. So the first problem you're going to have is that a subject and the Agatha is going to be scattered. So you don't know what's included, what's not included. Moreover, like we said, it's not dialectical. You don't have the back and forth. You don't have the question and answer. And therefore, when you do have a question, you're not immediately sure if this is a question or maybe your question might be totally off because there's supposed to be some hidden meaning behind it. Moreover, another principle we're told is that there's no machlokas, there's no disagreement in Agatha. If you find two Agatha teachings that seem to conflict, that means you haven't understood it properly. Or it means that there are talking on different dimensions. In the halakhic portions of the Talmud, lots of disagreement. In the Agatha portions of the Talmud, no disagreement. So how do you navigate trying to study an Agatha portion of the Talmud? And this is the answer. It's a very deep point. It is not studied extrinsically. The only way to study it is via imminent learning. Via learning from within. You have to discover the explanation and the answer from within yourself. And here's the idea. Essentially, our soul is a perfect mirror of Torah. So our soul understands the Agatha. The problem is, is that we are not connected with our soul. The only way to truly understand an Agatha teaching on your own is to become intimately connected to your soul and thus to become intimately, to become intimately connected to the Torah within your soul. And as you refine yourself, the teaching in the Agatha that you have spent a lot of time on and you have cogitated upon and you have ruminated upon over time, it may take years, it may take decades, something will click. A spark will be ignited within you. And the people that do this properly spend years really living, so to speak, with certain teachings. You read a teaching, you don't understand it, you acknowledge you don't understand it, and you spend some time with it. And it becomes your partner, becomes your friend becomes something that you periodically think about. And it's kind of hanging out there and you're waiting for something to click. You're waiting maybe for the Almighty to show you the other pieces of the Talmud that connect. You're waiting for some insight from within. But it's a very different kind of study. 
you have to approach it with sensitivity, with delicateness. You have to dwell within te- you have to dwell within the teaching until you get it, until it becomes part of you. My grandfather used to quote the Muslim masters who said that the teaching in the Agarata, every teaching in the Agarata is like a star. It's fiery, it's powerful, it's bright, it's brilliant, it's very far away. And that's the problem. And what you have to do is to make yourself into a telescope. So that way you can actually connect and see to it. And the more powerful you become, the more powerful your telescope becomes, and the more you're able to appreciate the beauty of the star far, far away. But here's another critical point. If you do this, if you are brave enough to dedicate maybe years of your life dwelling within a teaching in the Agarata, and you make a discovery, and you have something click, something goes off, something is ignited within you, that discovery will change your life. That discovery will serve as a base upon which you could build your spiritual life. You have unlocked a new approach through which you can live your life. And now everything can fit in to your new discovery. You'll you'll start to see your teaching, your insight appear everywhere. And you create like a unified theory of how to live your life and how to develop your spirituality. That's the power of every teaching in the Agarata. I want to quickly give y'all some more teachings just to run through them as a sample, just to get a sense of some of the lingo, of some of the structure, of the layout of some of these teachings. So the book of Bates, again, we're going through just parts of Talmud. On page 16a, <coughs> a very famous idea, Amar Reb Shem ben Lakish. Rabbi Shem ben Lakish said, God gives a person an extra soul on the eve of Shabbos. And on Shabbos, uh, after Matzah Shabbos, and on Matzah Shabbos, Saturday night after Shabbos departs, the soul is taken away from him. Again, no explanation, no details. This is all we got. Rosh Hashanah 4a, someone says, this coin is going to be given to Tzedakah in order that my son shall live, in order that I should merit through it. Olam Abba, behold, this is a completely righteous person. This one's also interesting. The book of Titus, page 8a. In the future, all the animals are going to gather around the snake and they're going to say to him, a lion crushes its enemy to death, but then he eats the animal. A wolf tears apart its prey and then he eats it. But you, you just sting and then you let the, let the prey die and then you leave. You don't even need it. Why do you do that? Says the snake, well, what benefit does someone who speaks Lashon Hara get from killing, so to speak, that person's victim? Finally, maybe one of my favorite teachings in all the Agarata, the first documented case of a near-death experience in Bava Basra, page 10b, Yosef, the son of Rabbi Yeshua, was sick and he died. And then he came back to life. And his father said to him, well, what did you see? And he responded, I saw an upside down world. I saw the lofty ones were lowly and the lowly ones were lofty. The world that I saw was opposite. So the father responded to him, no, 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 you didn't see an opposite world. You saw a clear world. And then the father asked. (coughs) And then the father asked, and the Torah sages, how do we appear? in that world so he responded the same way that you are viewed here you are viewed there and i also overheard that they said in that world 
praiseworthy is he who comes who comes here who comes here and his Torah is in his hand. And I also heard them say, those that were martyred by the Romans, no creation can be in their midst. There is so, so, so much wisdom in the Talmud. And today we've discovered that there's an entire body of Talmud that is interspersed throughout the halachic portions of the Talmud, is the non-halachic portions of the Talmud, and it deals with all kinds of stuff. And we're told this too is part of the oral Torah tradition. This too was necessary to write and perpetuate. However, it was critical that it was done in a way that it's not going to be abused. It's not going to be misinterpreted by the people who don't really know what's going on. And therefore, it was written in a way that it's deliberately concealed. But there's so much there. The Rambam, when he talks about the Agarata, he talks about one particular teaching from the book of Brachos, page 63b, I believe it is. And he says, it's like, it's unbelievable how much wisdom our sages packed into five, six words. And concludes the Rambam, if all you knew was this, if this is the only teaching in all of Talmud that you knew and you really understood it, you would have no doubt that this was written with divine assistance because the Agarata, an entirely different format. There's no questions. There's no answers. There's no guidance, really. There's, there's the, the dialectical approach of the halachic portions of the Talmud of the Shemaitza is just not present, but there's wisdom. But there's secrets but there's guidance that through this, we could connect to God. We could recognize God. We could develop a certain spiritual sensitivity where the Torah penetrates not just our mind, but our hearts as well. That is the Agarata. So much wisdom for us to discover. And that too is found in the Talmud. Now I want to point out that there's still one portion of the Talmud that we need to discuss at length. And that is the halacha. Because the Talmud, it works really, really hard in the halachic portions to try to get to the bottom line, but it doesn't do the tabulation for us. It doesn't say, okay, here's what we've discovered. So you have all the argumentation and you have all the dialogue back and forth, but the bottom line, the crystallized halacha of how you're supposed to behave, that too remained oral, even though it's found in the Talmud, but it's not explicitly spelled out in the Talmud, and thus it allowed for the further development of the oral Torah in the writing of the halacha, a monumental effort that really is still ongoing but it's a thousand years of the brightest people on this planet working on it. And that is something that we have to understand, we have to study, we have to spend time researching. And please God, we will do it next time.